Hi guys, my name is Avi. I trust everyone is well and keeping safe during these trying times. Uh, before I start, as this is my first ever video, I thought I should start by giving a small one-liner introduction of what I do. I've been in the IT field for close on to two decades with specific focus on coding and code level analysis. There are a few other things that I do as well, but we can talk about that another time or maybe check out my blog that I recently set up. The link is in the description below. It's recently set up, so it's not much things in there, but have a look. Maybe uh, hopefully you'll find something interesting and helpful uh, to you. Now, throughout my career, I've noticed that some people entering into this space find that it takes a while to understand some concepts or structures that can get them going quickly. And hence, I started this channel to play my part and try and assist where I can. Um, now, once again, and before I start, thank you for taking the time from your busy day to view my quick video on Stacks, which is aimed at assisting in attaining a better understanding of how it works, and in particular, with reference to reverse engineering, Windows binaries, and in, a, and in particular, assembly level code analysis. It's always important to gain a good understanding of foundations, which then aids in your understanding of a particular code snippet, or what the code snippet is doing or is intending to do. Now, of course, this applies in general to all, or stack applies in general to all Windows functions. But in this video, I'm simply focusing on understanding 32-bit stack in line with your reversing and analyzing efforts or aspirations. Hence, I have a quick comparison later on in this video with GHydra or Ghidra's variables. That's obviously, as I said, towards the end of this video. So without further ado, let's jump into it. As you can see on screen, I'm going to explain a 32-bit stack using a simple function call. Now, on your, on your left of the screen, I will show you some sample assembly statements, which will then result in the stack being engaged. And on the right, I'll show you uh, how the stack changes with each assembly instruction. Firstly, it's important to note that stacks always grow towards lower memory addresses, and it shrinks towards higher memory addresses. Now, let's look at a typical function statement in assembly, a function call in assembly, in which a function call expects two arguments that are first placed onto the stack, and then the actual function call is executed. In this example, which follows the CDECO convention, Argument two, you would see, is first pushed onto the stack at the highest memory address, which is then followed by argument one, which is pushed at a lower address than argument two. Remember, as I stated earlier, the stack always grows towards lower memory addresses. And when arguments are pushed onto the stack, it's pushed from right to left. So the last argument is pushed in first and then followed by the first argument. And as each argument is pushed in, they, it grows towards lower memory addresses. Hence, arg2 goes in first at the highest, followed by arg1. And then next, when the call to some function is executed, in our example there on the left-hand side, you'll see that a return address, i.e., the address of the next instruction to be executed after the function call is completed is then placed onto the stack at a lower address, which is above arg1. The reason for placing the return address on the stack is to enable the function to easily be able to return to the caller after it has completed the task that it needed to complete. At this point, the function's prolog kicks in in order to avail the necessary local variables that the function will need. As part of the function prolog, the contents of the EBP register are pushed onto the stack. The EBP value that is pushed onto the stack is known as the saved frame pointer, or SFP. The SFP value is actually the previous, functions, previous function call EBP value. So the SFP is saved to the stack in order to easily restore the previous function's EBP value, which will allow the previous function to easily locate its variables after the current function that we are in has completed. Thereafter, the value of ESP is moved into the available EBP register. Remember, at this point, it's important to note that ESP always points to the top of the stack, 
So at this point, the value of ESP is pointing to the memory address at which the SFP was copied into. Furthermore, at this point, the EBP value becomes the unchanging reference from which the location of the function, function arguments and local variables can be determined. In other words, EBP will be used to access the different variables. ESP, on the other hand, will continue to increase or decrease depending on the push or pop actions. And of course, this will change the uh, stack with it grows towards the lower or shrinks towards the higher memory addresses. Hence, let's say that this particular function call requires space for two local variables. Then, the sub ESP by 8 bytes uh, assembly instruction will result in the, stack grow, in the stack growing upwards towards lower addresses in order to create space for two local variables, as depicted on the stack region of the screen. A reminder, on a 32-bit stack, each element is 4 bytes. Hence, a sub-8 grows the stack by two elements, effectively creating space for two local variables. Note, at this point now, the ESP is now pointing at var1, which is the second variable at the top of the stack. Now that the stack is set up, the function arguments and variables can be accessed using the value that is at a relative distance from the EBP unchanging value. Remember, we are demonstrating a 32-bit stack, so each stack element is 4 bytes or 32 bits in length. Now an example, now, arg1 can be accessed using EBP plus 8, which is 8 bytes away, hence EBP plus 8. And R2 is accessible using EBP plus 0C, which is actually converted uh, is 12, which is the, implying that it's actually 12 bytes away from EBP. The reason why we use EBP plus 8 is because the red element displayed on the screen is already occupying 4 bytes below the current EBP position. And if you move 4 bytes lower than red, then you will actually get R1 value and hence 8 bytes. This pattern can continue if your function has more parameters that are being accessed, that are being passed to the function, and the remainder positions for each element will increment by 4 bytes at a time. Example, 10 hex for 16 and 14 hex for 20 and so on and so forth. In terms of local variables, the first variable var0 will be accessed using EBP minus 4 and the second EBP minus 8, respectively. Here you can see that var0 is actually 4 bytes away from EBP, hence EBP minus 4, and var1 is 8 bytes away from EBP, hence EBP minus 8. Now, on the function, now once the function has completed its task and is ready to return to the caller, the epilog then kicks in or is executed. At this point, the EBP value is moved into ESP, which effectively shrinks the stack and nullifying or nullifies the local variables, which nullifies the local variables. Now note that the top of the stack is now the SFP element. Thereafter, the pop EBP instruction is fired, which will then restore EB, the EBP value by copying the SFP into the, or the previous function's EBP into the EBP register. Note that the top of the stack now is actually the RET or the red element. The red assembly instruction then performs an implied pop EIP, which effectively pops the return address of the stack and places it into the EIP register. This enables the function to effectively pass control back to the caller at the required address of the caller. At this point, arg1 now becomes the top of the stack. Now the fact that EIP has been updated to the new address of the caller, which is the next instruction to be executed, the OS will then continue executing instructions after the function call by the caller itself. At this point, 
the caller using the CDECO convention will then start to clear the remaining function arguments of the stack using POP ARG1, POP ARG2 instruction, instructions respectively. This then clears the stack, which then awaits for the, uh, the next function prologues and epilogues to be initiated. Moving on, thought it would be good now just to bring in the G-Hydra aspect. So just to add, this is just a little more in terms of variables and how they are referenced both by debuggers and disassemblers. This is to assist with understanding how function arguments and parameters, as well as local variables, are used and named in debuggers and disassemblers. In general, variable locations are calculated using the EBP as the unchanging reference points, which as you can see on the screen, EBP would be pointing at SFP. As mentioned in the previous screen, you then saw that in our example, the function parameter locations were calculated as EBP plus 8 and or and 0C respectively for, function parameter, for the function parameters and EBP minus 4 and 8 for local variables, all of which are where a relative distance or are a relative distance from the EBP as shown in the diagram. However, a disassembler like G-Hydra works a little bit differently. It calculates the variable location as, a, as at a relative distance from the ESP when the function was entered. Now, when the function is entered, the return address, i.e. the ret element that you can see on the screen, is the first content that is placed on the stack and as such, ESP will be pointing here, and this becomes the reference point from which the variables are calculated. As I said, it can, it, this is displayed in the diagram in the blue circle on the right. All variable locations will be calculated from this point. As such, R1, which is the first argument, will now be referenced as ESP plus 4 because arg1 is actually four bytes away from the function entry point. And now two, which is the function, uh, and now arg2, which is also the function uh, argument, will now be referenced as ESP plus eight because arg2 is eight bytes away from the function entry point. Ghydra will also name these variables, which you'll see uh, when you reverse them, as param1 and param2 respectively in the assembly code itself, you would see that. Now, similar to function arguments, Ghydra will label local variables as ESP minus 8, because var0 is 8 bytes away from the function entry point, and ESP minus 0C because var1 is 12 bytes away from the function entry point. And similar to function arguments, Ghydra or Ghidra will label these variables as local 8 and local 12, respectively, in the code. That is my quick little video uh, explaining variables. I'd like to say thank you for tuning in. I hope this helps in adding to your understanding of 32-bit stacks and identifying variables in debuggers and disassemblers. There is, of course, a lot more to reversing binaries, and this aspect is just one of, uh, of many in terms of basic foundational aspects that is needed. An in-depth assembly course, that is, if you love code as I do, is needed as well. With that said, I intend on releasing a few more videos to assist in understanding some more concepts and structures on other foundational aspects, specifically targeting reverse engineering Windows binaries. So stay tuned and subscribe if interested. Thank you guys, stay safe, happy reversing slash analyzing code. Cheers.